Good afternoon. Good evening. Hey, how you guys doing? Good to see you, Bogus Sly and Jeffrey. Thank you for joining me in the live room. Hey, my name is Quinn Jacobson. This is the Studio Q Show. We call it live because we're live right now. But welcome, welcome. Um, I hope everyone's doing well, having a great week. It's good to see everyone jumping on YouTube. Mr. Tim Fry and Tom and Tom, oh, Tom twice and, and Maureen. Good to see you, Maureen. Yes, very, very long time no see. We have got a great show, I think, today. I think you guys are going to like this a lot. This is albumin printing. This is the final piece I'm going to do. I encourage you to download uh, Riley's book and read it in depth. I'm just going to skim over. I, I'm just going to highlight some things. This is going to be my last show live for a while. Um, I don't know how long. Uh, I'll talk about that at the end of the show. We'll see where we're at. I got a few updates to show you, so I'm going to just jump right on in here. Hey, Linda, good to see you. And uh, Mr. Johansson, good to see everyone in here. Thank you for joining me, seriously. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to do this, for sure. Um, we're going to jump over here. We're going to share this screen. And we're going to go do our regular thing. Today's the last week in November here in America, or I don't know, North America. We have uh, Thanksgiving, if you're into that, next week. I'm not really into holidays, so I don't do much any of that. But it, it is the 20th of November today, Saturday. A beautiful day on the mountain, sunny and nice. We're, we, we got some nice weather up here as well. Um, so like I said, this is the third part, uh, three of three. A reading from James Riley's book, The Albumin and Salted Paper a Book, The History and Practice of Photogenic, uh, Photographic, Photogenic, Photographic Printing, 1840-1895, um, Light Impressions, Rochester, New York. So this is, we're going to cover this today um, briefly. Albumin, there's so much to talk about, right? I mean, we could run down that rabbit hole deep. We only have, I try to keep it an hour. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do that today, but that's what we're going to do. I want to start out today. This isn't May 1st. This isn't Frederick Scott Archer Day or Wet Plate Collodion Day or anything like that. But as I was prepping for this show over the week, I ran into this albumin uh, negative that I made at the monastery in Heidelberg for this show in honor of Archer. Beautiful negative. One of the best negatives I made. It was sort of an 11th century monastery in Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, did albumin print and a salt print. And I had a triptych. I had the negative mounted i'd show you that but it's it's all packed away the negative it's a triptych negative in the center and albumin print on the right and a salt print on the left both both gold tone kind of encapsulated this whole thing we're looking at in riley's book but uh perfect light i shot it with a petzful lens which was really strange you can see a little bit of it there i couldn't find a straight up print of it but uh that's what we did um, I organized a bunch of photographers, wet clothing all over the world. And we put this, uh, I had this placard um, designed by an artist in London. And we had this put on his grave there, May 1st, 2010. That's what, coming up on 12 years. That uh, is a time just waits for no man. Um, uh, I, I had uh, Carl, oh yeah, uh, forgetting his last name now. Carl there on the left, me on the right. I had Carl uh, UK and John uh, Brewer in the UK kind of lead off. As an American, I didn't want to. I didn't want to take the helm on it, but I did. I had a lot of fun organizing this and putting it together, and it was great. So, if you're ever in London and you're near the Kensal Green Cemetery, walk around. It's a huge one. You'll see Archer's grave there, and the placard we put on it, and behind it, or to the yeah, to the other side of it, you'll see. Uh, Rylander's grave as well, too, another popular photographer. Uh, they actually did a ceremony for him inspired by this. But anyway, um, Archer really, you know, that wet collodion negative gave the world the albumin prints everybody was looking for. Here's my darkroom coming along. We're, we're, we're there. We're 90 percent there. Yeah, I'm excited. This is why um, I'm probably going to spend a couple of weeks uh, starting to prep up and shoot some stuff down there. And I'll come back with the with a show in a couple of weeks, hopefully, to, to show everybody what's going on. Um, right now, I have, uh, as of today, I have it plumbed. I have the sinks drained. I have uh, the red lights up, as you can see. I'm starting to stock my shelves with my chemistry, unpacking everything. 
and uh, we're close. And I just installed my dark room, spinning dark room door yesterday. Fits like a glove. It's perfect. I have a little bit of trim left to do and whatnot, but you can already see that light streaming in. That's that no big north light window off, off where I'm going to set up the to shoot. This is just unbelievable light up here. I am absolutely excited to make this happen. My little uh, Heidelberg plate got one on my dark box too. And as I was unpacking my uh, chemistry, I ran into this. I ha I didn't know that I'd done this. <laughs> I've done so much stuff in this process over the years. I've forgotten half of it. This is almost three years old, this collodion. <clears throat> and this is a cadmium iodide and ammonium iodide mixture. This is, uh, like I said, almost three years old. Looks like a couple of weeks old. This is a testament to CDI or cadmium iodide. When you employ that, this is perfect collodion to make negatives with. This is one of my first experiments. I'm going to actually remake everything and go off of Sutton's method one that we called it. Uh, I got a video to that. You can see it up there. August 7th is when we produce that. Um, but I'm going to, that's one of my first experiments that I'm going to be playing with uh, to do these rock formations. So that I thought that was interesting to show. Um, news and social media. Uh, I'm sure if you're a photographer, you've heard of Steve McCurry. I mean, if you haven't, you know, you should familiarize yourself with him. He's quite a quite a well-known photographer, photojournalist, documentary photographer. Um, but he had an article about that. He says Steve Mc, Mc, uh, McCurry fears a world uh, without photojournalism. I've said that for quite a long time now, especially with the advent of these phones and, and everybody has one and these high-res images and the quick transmission. This used to be a thing. It used to, as I was a photojournalist for years. You shot rolls of film, you went back to the darkroom, processed them, and then made contact sheets and printed them. And there was a skill to it. But, um, you know, it's at, at the end of the day, it's it's one of those things where um, you can't predict the future, but uh, photojournalism is dying. I love this quote out of the article. You can go over to theartnewspaper.com and read it if you want. It says, someday the world is going to be one vast homogenous airport terminal. <laughs> I love that. That is that, that's a great way to put it. But uh, yeah, uh, Tom says, "How will your darkroom drains manage the dichromates?" Uh, I don't drain dichromates actually, um, and I also have. Uh, uh, if you if you're talking about uh, clearing uh, oil prints, um, I have a separate system that I can actually I can actually catch anything off my drain that I want in buckets or canisters or whatever I want. And I can, you know, whatever I'm draining, I have the option outside because I plumbed it myself. I have an option outside, an inch and a half line that I can divert anywhere and anything. If I'm working on something like that, I'm not going to drain anything um, in what's what I call a French drain, rocks and soil. Um, I'm not going to drain anything dangerous into that. Um, so I'm not going to put any silver nitrate down the drain or any uh, cadmium products or anything like that. But dichromate, so if, when I'm doing that, if I'm washing oil prints, it'll be diverted. But it's a fair question, and we are, we're all concerned with the environment, especially on my own land, right? I have a water well here, so I drink the water and, and use the water up here. So, But good question. Um, so let's, let's jump into this. We have a lot to cover right now. Uh, this is uh, Riley's book, uh, Albumin uh, Printing. I bet you you're going to learn something right off the bat here. If you haven't read this, this is fantastic. I mean, this is a, a great piece of information. Oh, Tom says, yeah, yeah, exactly. A tank with, uh, yeah, citric acid, absorbic acid uh, to neutralize the dichromates. There's many ways to do that. And if you are draining something dangerous, I do recommend that you have a system that you can divert or hook a, a barrel or something onto that or a bucket, something that you, you can handle that with. So that's, that's a good one. You don't want to be putting it down a community sewer system or a city sewer system or anything like that. And especially if you have your own property, we're, all, we're completely off the grid, right? We have our own septic system, our own water well. It's, you don't want to be damaging the land and things like that. So, yeah, that's great. There are many ways to take care of the dichromates. Not that we have a whole bunch of them, but, yeah, be aware of that. So, anyway, this is very interesting. The first published notice of the use of albumin paper in photography occurred in the following letter, which appeared in this publication, May 11th, 1839. The Athenium, I guess, is what you, how you say it. Photogenic drawing. Considering that 
may, however trifling, improvement will not be unacceptable to those of your readers who feel an interest in this art, I have been inter induced to communicate the following method of preparing the paper. Look at this. This is 1839, which after many experiments I find to succeed best. Wash the paper with a mixture of equal parts of white of an egg and water. Afterward, afterwards, the solution of nitrate, uh, a silver, nitrate of silver fixing the drying as usual with the potassium iodide. HL. That's all they know about this person, right? HL. There's a little quotation there. To the as yet unidentified experimenter, HL must go to the honor of producing the first photographic photographs on albumin paper. So Everard has always contributed with this, and we'll we'll find out why. But you probably never heard of this HL. I hadn't until I read this book. Um, and it's not truly albumin paper. I mean, it is, but but we'll we'll see why it, it differs a little bit. It is notable that his or her work with albumin followed so closely upon Talbot's revelation of February 39. The actual working details of photogenic drying, plain salted paper, we know what that is. We looked at that last time. Of course, a method described by HL differs from the usual practice of the albumin printing process in one vital aspect. It does not call for the addition of any chlorides to the albumin. That's the difference there. So when we're really talking about albumin paper, and prints, that's what we're, albumin silver print, that's what we're talking about. Um, and and it, they evolved, I mean, even from the, the, the onset, they, they evolved tremendously. Not until 1850 did Mr. Everard, Blankhart Edvard, Everard, um, supply the missing chlorides and earn the distinction of having the invented the albumin printing process, the most practical, practical and useful form, see below. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. And then here comes along uh, comes along the very first general treatise on photography, Robert Hunt's popular treatise on the art of photography, published in Glasgow in 1841, includes this suggestion. By soaking the paper in a solution of isinglass, that is a substance obtained from the dried swim bladders of fish, kind of like a gelatin, right? Kind of like uh, when we talk about gelatin, we're talking about tendons and hooves and animal parts. That's how gelatin is made. This is from fish bladders. Um, isinglass or parchment size or rubbing it over with a white of an egg and drying it prior to the application of sensitive wash. It will be found to blacken much more readily. So there's another kind of reference. You see, you start seeing this evolution and this, this uh, evolving idea of how these printing processes, how photography in general really came about as you read through this old literature. That's why I'm such a, big fan of it. And that's why I spend so much time doing this. Um, so let's go on to the invention of the albumin printing process. Everard, the guy that a French photographer who made many important contributions to the photography, he was both a talented photographer and technical innovator. And his writings on photography were very influential. Without doubt, his most useful and far reaching discovery was the albumin print, the photographic medium upon which uh, the last half century of the 19th century was recorded exactly. Albumin printing, rain king. We talked about that last time, and we know why. The discovery of albumin paper came in the late 1840s as Mr. Everard searched for improvements in Talbot's calotype process. A few weeks ago, we did a piece on calotypes, and you, you, you see this evolution of these printing processes there again. And it was somewhat successful in using albumin as a carrier for the white sensitive salts on paper and negative or a binder, right? And he went on to further adapted it to the usual method of making positives on plain salted paper. It worked splendidly as a positive material and provided a deeper, uh, deeper holder image than could be obtained on the same matte solid papers of the day. He communicated that his discovery to the world in a brief account of his various photographic researches, and he presented it to the French Academy of Sciences on May 27, 1850. So that's kind of the idea of how this, this print process evolved. Um, his original recipe for the perspiration of albumin paper was simple. White of an egg was beaten into froth. 25% by weight of a saturated salt solution, and the mixture was allowed to settle overnight. It's basically the same thing we're going to look at now um, as we go through this. To print with a material, the paper had to be sensitized by floating on a strong solution of silver nitrate and dried again. It was then ready to place in the printing frame and exposed to daylight. Thus, 
It may be seen that albumin paper is essentially the same process of plain solvent paper, except that egg white is employed as a binder material to close the pores of the paper and retain the white sensitive substance in a compact layer on the surface. It is precisely because the image is retained in the print on the, in the, on the print surface that albumin paper represented such a great advance in the print boldness and contrast, and that it possess, possessed increased capacity to reproduce fine detail. That was, those are the big ones. The albumin paper process appeared at almost the same time as the discovery of the revolutionary wet collodion negative process by Mr. Archer. Yes. These two photographic materials were seemingly created to meet the needs of each other. Tonally, albumin paper made fine prints from the kind of negatives that the wet collodion process generated and the increased capacity for detail in the albumin print exactly answered the needs of the new glass negative. By 1860, they had become established as the dominant, almost the only negative and positive uh, materials used. There's a connection right there. The albumin print really took off. Why? Because of the wet collodion negative. This is this is a really important connection that, that we tend to kind of overlook a lot of times. Um, oh, collodionista. Last weekend I made negatives as you teach in your book. Oh, good. We'd love to see him. If you want to, if you want to show him sometime, we'd love to see him. It is no wonder that only two paper mills in the world managed to consistently produce paper the necessary quality. And these two mills were able to maintain their monopoly from the 1860s until approximately 1920-ish, right? A little before that, World War I. They were above mentioned, uh, the, the Clevler Company in Reeves, or Rives, France, and the product was known as Reeves Paper, and the Steinbach and Company located in Malmede, Belgium, at the time part of Germany. And the, uh, the paper was known outside Germany as Sax Paper. Both papers were machine made, all rag paper, sized with a mixture of starch and resin soap. Um, so we're going to talk about papers, and I'm going to show you what I recommend today. You you really can't get these papers anymore. You, you can. I, I'll show you something here, very interesting. You can get them, but it's not. Uh, they're not the original papers, but these the, these work fine. Um, so it goes on to say, nearly all stereo views before 1890 were made on albumin paper. So uh, we, we see this emergence in 1860 all the way through um, wet collodion until the dry plates kind of took hold in the late 1880s, 1890s. Um, albumin paper still went on, even with the dry plate coming on. Albumin paper changed considerably over the years between its introduction in 1850 and its ultimate disappearance as a commercial article in 1929. The earliest albumin prints strongly resembled the salt prints of the late 1840s. So you can see the evolution here as we, we, we go through this. Albumin prints didn't start off the way they look or you, the way you can make them today uh, or the way they did in, in the 1860s. <clears throat> they were chocolate brown or reddish brown in color, but of course did possess some degree of added gloss and depth depending on the amount of water added to the albumin. Two great technical advances in the albumin printing process that solidified its primacy were the introduction of alkaline gold toning methods and the refinement of coating techniques to allow for quite glossy prints. Both of these refinements were made in the decade 1850 to 1860. We're going to look at both of those <clears throat> and see what really makes this. So the preparation of the albumin solution. So only the freshest available eggs should be used, even though the albumin will be allowed to age before coating it on paper. Um, only the freshest stuff should be used. So I recommend if you can get to a farm or you can get, you know, good fresh organic eggs, farm what they call free range eggs. Excuse me. They do make a big difference in this process. They really do. Um, each large age will provide about one ounce or 28 mils, if you will of albumin. So if you have 10 eggs, you have about 280 milliliters. That'll give you an idea of how many. And if you're good at separating, right, that's, I'm going to show you a little trick here. You probably have already seen this, but although <clears throat> the latter sort are preferable, supermarket eggs will suffice for the purpose of preparing, preparing albumin paper. The eggs should be separated completely and only the clear white saved without the slightest contamination of yolk, blood, or stringy tissue known as chalazy. 
Let me let me show you this here. Those working with albumin. Albumin paper, you can take a plastic bottle, dump your egg, crush the bottle, suck the yolk up. You can leave the yolk in the bottle, and there's your nice, fresh albumin with no yolk. So that gives you a quick way to separate the chalazy, the stringy stuff, the yolk, and leave just the clear egg white or albumin and that's what you want so grab you a couple of plastic bottles if you have the cheap ones they'll crack and break on you you got to have that air section to pull that yolk out but that's a that's a good way to separate them without see the problem is if you break a yolk and you have 300 mils of <laughs> albumin you just destroyed that you, you, and it's it's painful to see and it's painful to get those emails so that's a quick way to do it. If you're going to make you some albumin, I recommend you doing that. Um, and then you've got this, what to do with the yolks. Of course, we know what you can do with the yolks. Eat them, make a cheesecake, whatever you want. With albumin. So when the albumin, uh, uh, when the albumin has been obtained from the eggs, the next step is to beat it into a froth with the appropriate amount of ammonium or sodium chloride. Prints with similar color and contrast may be expected with the use of either of these chlorides, okay? Um, or both using a combination of the correct amount. You can actually split it up if you want, if you have a reason for that. The amount of chloride used has a definite relation to the sensitivity and to a small extent the contrast of the paper. We're going to talk about contrast control later. But this has a definite relation to sensitivity. Papers with a low one to one and a half percent chloride content are less sensitive and tend to produce slightly more contrasty prints. So if you're if you're putting 10 to 15 grams in a liter, that's what you're going to get. Um, oh, sorry. Let's see. Today in the Facebook. Oh, good. Yeah. He said, sorry. He says, uh, Collodianisa says, of course. I will share today in the Facebook group. Okay, good. Share them. And, if, and uh, maybe if I can grab them next time, I'll have them on here. Hey, Farid. Uh, hola, chicos. And ch y chicas, both. Chicos y chicas. Um, so if you're using a low salt content, uh, they're less sensitive and tend to produce a slightly more contrasty print from thin negatives than do papers with a normal chloride content of one and a half to two and a half. I split the difference and I say 20 grams right there. I say 20 grams. If you have my book, you can see my recipe in there. This slight gain in contrast is at the expense of a rich, dense negative. A rich, dense image, sorry. This is, that's the problem with that, right? So you're dealing with like film negatives and things like that. You want a low chloride content. Um, however, so it is best, however, so it is best in ordinary circumstances to keep the chloride at one and a half or above. So 20 grams in one liter produces a 2% salt content in, in the egg whites. On the other hand, the use of more chloride in the formula than is necessary only results in higher silver consumption. Just like if you over iodize a collodion, you're gonna eat your silver bath content away. Same thing here, silver chloride is the same as silver iodide that way <clears throat> without conferring any additional benefits. The chloride, ammonium chloride was the most commonly used in the 19th century should be dissolved in a minimum of a minimum amount of water and added to the egg white before beat the beating process. So it's dissolved. If a blender is used, beat the whites is not necessary. So don't use a blender. Only use uh, egg beaters, the two egg beaters. That's the best way to, to denature and break down the proteins in this stuff. Beating the albumin is necessary to accomplish the task of chemically breaking down the different protein substances until more or less a uniform substance is created. While beating to a froth does the major work of evening out the viscosity of albumin's different components, further denaturing by a chemical means must take place before the albumin is ready to apply to the paper. So what is denaturing? Denaturing is breaking down those, those whites, breaking them down, straightening those little pieces of uh, those little components in the white out, if you will. Heat does that. Acids does that. Beating does that. That's why we add a little glacial acidic acid to this, um, uh, to these egg whites. 
<laughs> Tom says, brings a whole new meaning to the term. Go suck an egg. Yeah, suck it with your plastic bottle, Tom. <laughs> That's a good one. Chopper says, seen the other day where one used a fine mesh nylon reusable almond milk bag to pass only the whites. No beating needed this way. Uh, no, you, you, you'd have to, you mean to separate the whites from the yolk? You can do anything as long as it doesn't let the chalaze through the stringy stuff and you don't break a yolk. The problem with I, I have with stuff like that is until you have the clean white, uh, whites separated, you're always at the risk. If you leave little parts in it, if you leave, if you break a yolk in it, you're, you're going to be in trouble. But I haven't, I haven't tried that. The only thing that I've ever done is I've done it by hand, separating them, run the risk of having a, an eggshell crack, you know, sharp point on an eggshell, and you're trying to get the whites out of the shell, and you break the yolk, and it drips down, and you're, you're screwed. Um, and then I, I always use the plastic, but I can do I can do 20 eggs, you know, in no time with that method that I just showed you there on the video. But no, I'm not familiar with that chopper. You can expound on that if you want. But it breaks it to denaturing. There's several ways to denature it and, and chemical. We beat it physically with the egg beater, and then we add an acid, a little bit of acid to it, and that breaks it down. And you need to do that to make put it on the paper. Um, formation of the photographic game. But they also help denature the albumin, right, the acids. One of the effects of, of adding chlorides is to reduce the volume of froth, froth produced during the beating step. The third kind of denaturing treatment usually employed is the adjustment of pH by the addition of acids or alcohol. We only use the glacial acidic acid. The chemical forces which bind together the enormous molecules of protein grow weaker as the pH is lowered and the physical properties of the substance change as a result. So the nature is denatured, right? That's, that's why they call it that. The effect of adding chlorides and acids, such as acidic acid, and finally beating the egg white, is to completely and irreversibly change it, to denature it. After settling for 24 hours and aging in a refrigerator for a week, it is a yellowish, homogenous liquid with a slight aged odor. Uh, I, I yeah, Aged odor, I guess, maybe. But there's a recipe that he recommends, 15 grams, that's 1.5%. That's on the lower end. And honestly, most people making negatives today don't make the Sutton type of negative. So that's probably why they lean in that direction. Two mils of glacial acidic acid combined with uh, uh, 30 mils of water, about an ounce of water, and one liter of egg whites or albumin. My recipe is over on the right, 15 to 20 grams. I say 20 grams, two mils of glacial acidic acid, and clean white egg, egg whites or albumin. So you beat this substance, th these egg whites, until you have what's called stiff peaks. Until you take the bowl and you turn it upside down, and you have no liquid. It's just solid egg white. Um, cover it in the container, strain the mixture, cover and refrigerate for a week. You can do that. I've, I've actually made albumin one day, set it in the fridge the next, pulled the white, the, the meringue or the, the stiff whites off the top, filtered the solution, uh, the, the egg whites and the salts in it. Through a, through a filter and let it come up to room temperature and started floating paper and it works great. But the longer you wait, they even had this thing where they'd use this old, really old albumin and you could smell it on the papers and that's why they knew it was it was good albumin. So, and you can use it for a long time. I've, I've had albumin stored for a very long time and it works great. So coating paper with albumin, the ba basic mechanism is the same is if you're a floating salt paper. Fold the edges up. I'm going to show you a little video here in a second. Use the thin, smooth, all rag stock uh, is necessary, the paper. He recommends a Strathmore Series 500 drawing paper. That's pretty thick stuff in comparison to these other two that I'm going to recommend. Uh, and he says, although it's somewhat heavier than usual, raw stocks, this paper will perform satisfactorily. And it does. I've used that. Then he goes on to talk about using a surfactant such as Kodak Photo Flow to keep the bubbles down and to keep the, the, the drain consistent off your papers. He uses four mils of that per liter of albumin. And it, it improves runoff and controls bubbles. That's what he's talking about there. Um, so he, he talks about it cannot be, the paper can't be immersed completely in the, in the albumin. 
Um, like I, I show how you can do salt. You just completely immerse it, pull it out, hang it up and go for it. Um, in this uh, sizing and gelatin solution for salt papers. Um, I think it was Dale that uh, started experimenting with completely immersing um, the paper in albumin. He didn't have any problems. Here's the problem with that. If, if, if you have certain types of paper, that'll pull through and bleed to the back, or if you have anything on the back, I just recommend floating it. I'll show you how I do it here. And like he says, it's not really difficult. I float for three minutes. But he says a minute to a minute and a half. You can experiment. This is all different ways to do this. Um, the glossier the paper, the higher the temperature. So the drying rooms in the 19th century were kept at 30 to 50 Celsius. <laughs> that's, that's pretty toasty. And they got these beautiful high gloss, high temperature, uh, high gloss um, papers. But it's not necessary. It offers a way to improve the gloss. But I'll show you how to double coat here. You can get as much gloss as you want. Um, and, and when you're draining them, you can get a big buildup of albumin on the edge of the paper. Blot that stuff off after you float your paper so you don't get that. It takes a long time to dry, too. Um, Farid says, uh, I guess the coating is needing for the silver not to be soaked in. Exactly. That's what it is. This binder keeps the silver off the paper so you don't get it into the fibers and it doesn't mat it out like salt paper does, right? This is a complete separation. That's why you get this brilliant, sharp, fine detailed image. That's that's what they were talking about a minute ago then. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this doesn't have any audio to it. I, I just clipped it off. If you have my video, video series, uh, you can watch this with audio. I'll just comment over it. Um, this is, uh, this is how I do it. I have these little styrofoam lifts that I put my tray on. I have this piece of mirror. Yeah, it's cracked and broken. I don't care. It's front surface mirror. It doesn't have to be. Um, I put the mirror down and I use these two pieces of styrofoam on the edges to hold my tray. And that way I can see underneath the paper and see if I have any bubbles. There are other ways to do it. I like this method the best. I've tried all of them. I like this the best. So um, I'm just talking about, I can see, I can see the entire paper. I don't have to hold the paper up and look at it and all that junk. So here I'm going to talk about using crowbar paper. That's my preferred paper. If you're in Europe, you can get crowbar readily. It's readily available. And it's the, in my opinion, it's the best paper out there for um, albumin prints. There's my liter or almost liter of albumin. I'm just talking about you know, you saw me make this the week or video before. I'm just checking the size, looking at the paper. It's all folded up. I show you how to fold it in the, the video before to prep the paper. And notice how I pour the albumin in, just in the side, very gently. You don't want to hold it up. This stuff bubbles, and these bubbles are like iron domes. They're, they're, they're impossible to pop unless you have a plastic toothpick. So be very careful. Uh, you'll still, you may still get one or two. I use a little piece of paper and I just scrape, skim over the top of the albumin and you can remove about anything. And it's inevitable. You're going to have these things happen. So I used almost a liter there. It's a big tray. It's nine inches by 12 inches, um, you know, 30 centimeters long and, you know, 20 centimeters wide. But I was just saying that's really old albumin. Uh, you can see the color difference there and it still works great though. Um, and so now I'm going to float a piece of paper. Let's see if I can zoom up to it uh, as we go along. Oh, Jeffrey said he had the honor to meet Steve Curry about 10 years ago. Oh, cool. That's that's awesome. Bogus loss is a great idea. Yeah, um, this is this is my method. Uh, worth, I, I think I say it's worth the price of admission. This is my method to make your bubble problem go away. And I use it on the silver bath as well, too, right? You, you especially don't want that on the silver either. Bubbles are more of a problem because albumin has a tendency to bubble so, so quickly on this stage than the silver bath stage. <clears throat> Do you bend one, uh, one side 90 degrees for easy lift off? Yeah, Fareed, you're going to see me here. If you're watching the video, you'll see me float this piece of paper. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to do it right now. What I talk about is once you folded the edges up, I talk about breaking down those fibers on the like kind of like a, a cigar roll. So it curls the paper up like this, because if you have if you don't, you have these big bands and they'll create great big bubbles uh, because they won't touch the surface of the paper. <clears throat> so here I am. I see a bubble already. Um, I'm just going to pop it with my finger there. My hands are clean and I'm going to lay it back down. And I'm just going to watch it, lay it over, lay it over. I'm going to use my finger to just, fingers just to slowly push it down. And there we go. Now I'm looking for bubbles. And I'm going to go ahead and lift uh, lift this up. After a few seconds on it, I just like to look at it, check the surface of it. And I like a super clean surface on these prints, right? That's the whole idea of it. It's just really super clean. My finger works great at this stage. I haven't started my timer yet. This is just getting it wet, getting it to lay down on the albumin. And uh, and here I go. Now I'm going to start my timer. But fingers are a little sticky. Now, yeah, I talk about it raising it. The fibers get wet and they stick up like that. And then I they relax and it curls back down. And it works really, really well. <clears throat> this method works really well. Uh, I just say that I'm all clear on bubbles. No bubbles there. You can see, although I'm not focused on the paper, you can still see the the uh, paper underneath there on the mirror. And there's the paper floating on top. And three minutes pass, and you'll see how I lift this up. And I talk about you don't want to create a bunch of bubbles as you lift it up either. So uh, you'll see how I do that here. So three minutes have passed. No bubbles. I don't know what I'm saying there, but now I'm going to lift it off. Yeah, and again, if you have my video set, you'll. See, this is just a clip. I just wanted to show you floating the paper on albumin is probably the most difficult thing to do in the process, and then floating it on silver. But they're very similar. So there, I peel it up, I unfold the edges, and what I talk about here is the gravity is pulling it down this way. I turn it over for a more even coat of albumin, and I hang it from that side, which I originally uh, held it up with. So there it is. And that's it. Just talk about an even coat. So that's how I float albumin paper with a mirror, the tr using a glass tray. Um, very, very straightforward stuff. Not, not rocket science there. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the paper here that we use. Uh, the Canson or Canson has this universal sketch paper that's available at um, Freestyle Photographic or FreestylePhoto.biz. This is the paper that you want if you can't get the crowbar. If you can get the crowbar, use the crowbar. They're both cancer products, but get the crowbar if you, you can get it. I brought a whole stack of this stuff back with me from Europe. So, so I'm good on albumin paper for a few years. Those are the two papers you want to use. And that's what he talks about. So let's talk about double coating. This is really important for a couple of reasons. Um, Double coating allows uh, you to get, uh, I always call it like the Ilford Pearl paper. If you're in, if you ever worked with the old develop out papers that are now pretty much gone, this is a beautiful pearl. This is a just a, you, you double coat these, you can triple coat them, quadruple coat them, whatever you want. But if you do more than one coat, you're going to see the difference in this paper. So what is double coating? There will always be a slight difference in gloss and thickness of coating between the top half of the sheet and the bottom half. This is another reason I flip it over. I've never noticed what he's talking about, but I do a lot of double coating. And double coating allows you to even that out even more so on the uh, application of the albumin. The severity of this effect depends on a large number of factors, but it's usually not so pronounced as to render a batch of paper completely unusable. It's not. <clears throat> Obviously, many of the characteristics of the finished prints depend on the thickness and glossiness of the coating of the albumin. Among these are the ultimate. Uh, among these are the ultimate color of the prints, their brilliance and depth. That's what we're talking about here, and the ease of toning and fixing. Toning and fixing are more difficult with thicker coatings because the albumin becomes increasingly less permeable as the coating thickness increases. So be aware of that. You're going to need a stronger gold toning solution on double coated papers, a little more fixing, stronger fixing or longer fixing on double coated papers than single coated. 
As mentioned above, one of the most attractive features of albumin paper in the 19th century was its glossy surface and, and added depth. So experiments were made to increase the coating thickness by using multiple coatings of albumin. It was soon learned that some form of hardening or coagulating step was necessary between coatings to render the first coating insoluble, meaning the only way to keep this first coat of albumin on the paper after it's dried is you need some form of hardening or coagulating of the albumin that's on that paper. That's what we're talking about. Otherwise, there was no gain in thickness of the amount of albumin on the first sheet. So if you float a sheet of albumin paper, let it dry, and float it again and think you're getting two coats, you're not. You're floating that first coat off, and you're going to remain with one coat. So you need to harden it between these floatings, right? Now, this is what we're talking about. And there he says, because the second coating step dissolved off the albumin remaining from the first coating operation. There are three possible approaches to hardening the albumin between the first and second coating operation. The simplest and most widely used method during the 19th century was to store the paper in a warm loft for six months. So heat and time will harden the albumin on the paper. And they had time to do this. They didn't have, you know, time was plentiful back in the day. We want fast and easy today, right? Um, during which time a slow curing process sufficiently hardened the albumin. If a, a speedy result is desired, there are two instantaneous approaches. One is to subject the albumin to a, a current uh, steam, a, a, to a current of steam, meaning if you have a humidifier, you can cook the albumin on the paper with hot steam water. Um, uh, cooks the albumin and renders it insoluble. The other is easier and more practical and involves briefly immersing the sheet in a 70% solution of isopropyl alcohol. So the only catch here is you, this alcohol is going to coagulate or cook or harden the albumin, but you need the same amount of ammonium chloride in this hardening bath as you do as in your albumin. So if you put 15 grams in your one liter of albumin, you need 15 grams in your one liter of isopropyl alcohol. You use 20, you use 20. That will, if you don't, that will leach that out of there. So be, co be cognizant or be aware of that. So that's the only caveat there. So 15 to 20 grams of ammonia. So we do 20 grams of, of ammonium chloride and in one liter of 70% isopropyl alcohol. You briefly put it in, I say 15 to 30 seconds. Riley says you can just run it through. And I am sure you can. It, it'll cook um, if you just run it through. He says, uh, solution in a tray and slowly pull the sheets of albuminized paper through the solution and hang them up to dry. And they dry extremely fast. I mean, they dry extremely fast. When they are dry, they should be placed in a pile and flattened under some weights, make them easier to manipulate. Then you go back on to the albumin the opposite direction. You mark the paper. So you drained it this way on the first coat. You turn it around and drain that on the second coat. You get this beautiful, glossy pearl finish. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Sensitizing. Once the sheets have been albuminized, they will keep very well in a cool and dry place. You can keep albuminized paper forever. I found some just yesterday. It's probably five years old. It's perfect. There's no problem with it. In fact, it was in my uh, heat press. I opened it up and I had a whole stack of, of albumin, albuminized paper in my heat press. Um, it will keep well and it'll store forever. Once you albumin, or once you sensitize it on a silver bath, though, that's a different story. You want to use it up really fast in a, in, within a day. I, I say within a day. So the, the albumin paper should be floated on a 10 to 12 percent silver nitrate solution for two and a half to three minutes. I say 12 percent for three minutes. The type of negatives that I make, the Sutton type of negatives, you could go all the way up to 15, 20%. We talked about those high silver content baths. That depends on your negative. No additive, no additives to the sensitizing bath are required in the ordinary course of printing. Make sure that there are no air bubbles trapped under the sheet. We talked about how to do that. And it, it gives it what they call measles. You'll get little white spots everywhere. Um, Facebook user, I don't know what your name is, but hello. Gwen, are you immersing the paper between the coats or floating it on top? Oh, Drew, that's Drew. 
Um, no. You albuminize the paper, the first coat. Uh, you saw that, how I did that. You hang it up. You let it fully dry, flatten it out. And I don't really flatten it out because I'm going to double coat it. Once it's dry, you take your one liter of isopropyl alcohol and your ammonium chloride. You run it through the chloride, completely immerse it in the alcohol hardening bath and hang it up and let it dry, then float it again. So you immerse it in the hardening and you float it on the albumin. You know what? That's a great question, Christian. Uh, Christian. Yes, you can. 187 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, almost 100 degrees, uh, 100, about 90, 95 degrees, 100 degrees, well, 95 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. You'd have to experiment to see where that temperature falls. It's a lot easier to do with alcohol. I'm telling you, I have experimented with a heat press a couple of times. It seemed to work okay, but it was kind of a hassle because it's a crapshoot. You never know what you're doing, but that's a great question. Yes, you can do that. You're very welcome, Drew. No problem. So a 12, 10 to 12%, depending on your negative, no air bubbles and off you go. You've got a sensitized paper. So he's talking about these sensitized albumin papers will be in good condition to 24 to 48 hours. Um, in the summertime, I'd say one day, uh, they, they, they'll start turning on you quick. That that silver deep chloride decomposes fast. Um, he talks about putting it, you know, no white light, make sure your uh, contact print printer's in good shape, and you're ready to print. So print exposure. So the biggest difficulty arises from the fact that the color intensity of the exposing light affect the color and ultimate contrast of the print. So let's talk about this here real quick. Albumin and solded prints are primarily sensitive to ultraviolet radiation and, uh, and only to much lesser extent to visible blue light. So when people talk about blue light, we really have to get our nanometers and, and our visible and non-visible light spectrum understanding down, both for making wet collodion images and, and printing here. So blue light isn't necessarily, you know, visible light isn't necessarily good for albumin printing. He's talking about UVA and UVB, stuff we can't see with our eye. <clears throat> um, so in choosing the light source, expose albumin and solid prints in the main. Consideration is not how bright the light appears, but how much UV radiation it emits. The most convenient source of UV radiation is, of course, the sun. Historically, no artificial light sources were available until the advent of the electric arc plant in the 1880s. And you can read about that hassle uh, in, in, the, in the text there. But my uh, coming up here, building this studio and dark room, um, I've committed to a format. I've, uh, you know, the size of uh, plates and prints that I'm going to make. And I've committed to no power other than my solar stuff that I have in my studio and no running water necessarily. This is all, I got big tanks of water, rainwater, distilled water. Um, I'm and, and I know printing stuff. I'm not gonna use, I'm gonna use sun. I'm gonna go back old school, 19th century, just like they did it. I have more modern conveniences, of course, but <clears throat> no more, I'm not gonna use my, uh, my printing out box anymore. In fact, I'm probably gonna end up getting rid of that at some point. But I'm just going to use sun, the sun to make images, the sun to print images. That's where I'm at. I know it's not feasible for everyone, but that's my course of action right now. Um, <clears throat> so let's go over to free. So my neg would be soft. I raise, I raise the silver content. No, you lower it. You lower it. Same with your chloride content in your albumin. If your negative is thin, you lower both of those. Yeah, you lower both of those. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's light. Use the light. Um, use the sunlight if you can. So let's talk about the effect of the light source on print contrast. So you're you're going to hear about this a lot. You you can look on you know YouTube, do a Google search, whatever, and you see people printing out and why they're printing out, why they say they're printing out. I'll give you a, a, a pretty honest statement on today's wet clothing negatives from everyone. Excuse me, a little drink of coffee. Everyone's wet collodion negatives are thin today, pretty much thin. Rarely 
if ever, have I seen a Sutton type method one negative. And this is why they like to print out in the shade. A very intense light source lowers contrast in the print, direct sun. While a weaker light tendency tends to heighten print contrast, shade. Thus, the old rule found in many 19th century manuals, very true, which advises that dense, vigorous negatives, Sutton Method 1 negatives, be printed in sunlight and thin, weak negatives printed in the shade. This is why you see a lot of people say, oh, I print out in the shade for a half an hour or 20 minutes or whatever because I get more contrast. That tells me their negative isn't dense enough. That's exactly what the 19th century says, and that's what Riley's saying here. <clears throat> Printed in the shade means facing open sky, but not directly in the sunlight. So open north shade, where you'd make an image maybe, right? Also recommended in many old manuals is the technique of covering the printing frames with tissue paper or ground glass. You'll see this often as well, too. And printing in direct or filtered sunlight. Whether the majority of printing will be done in the shade or in the sunlight depends on the character of the negatives to be printed. Exactly. If the printer is using negatives of his or her own that were intended exclusively for albumin and solid paper printing and providing the local uh, local offers a fair amount of annual sunshine and the locale, locale offers, the, the area offers like the mountains of Colorado, offers amount of annual sunshine, then a good plan is to try and make negatives so that they will stand up to full sunshine. This is why it's important that you can print out in full sunshine. Not only will the prints be more permanent, they will also have a more pleasing tone and look richer and more brilliant. So clue number 32 of 19th century Wet collodion negative making photographers, why do their prints look so good? Here's another clue right there. So if you follow along in the shows, you'll pick up these little clues of why are the negatives and prints so different today versus the 19th century? Here's another clue to that. Um, a big one, actually, a big one. Do you think white paper, Chopper says, do you think white paper might reflect any of the UV back up to the albumin? Just wondering if exposing with printing on albumin glass prints will slower than on white paper. Um, yeah, you, you, but you're, look, this is such a slow pro. If you're doing albumin, we are slow. I mean, we are so slow ISO. It wouldn't affect it if it did, really, I don't think. Um, but, you know, fair, fair question. But I don't think you're, you're, uh, you're going to have a problem there. So, the color of the exposing light also has an effect on the print contrast, right? The, the higher the proportion of blue light and the lower proportion of yellow light, think of that on the spectrum, <clears throat> the exposure source contains the greater will be the tendency toward a softer, flatter print. The greater the proportion of yellow and less blue exposing, uh, exposing source contains, the greater will be the tendency toward a more contrasty print. But of course, with an accompanying lengthening of exposure time. So you start putting the pieces together here. So let's talk about exposure time here. The speed of albumin and salted papers. Here you go, Chopper. The speed of albumin and salted papers is exceedingly slow. Matte salted papers like arrowroot paper are the fastest, followed by plain salted papers, and the slowest of the lot is albumin paper. So we talked about arrowroot. That's on my list. You'll see some arrowroot prints coming out in the next few months. Those are the fastest of these pot, uh, printing out processes here. An average exposure time of albumin paper in direct sunlight is five to 10 minutes with a good, hard Sutton Method 1 negative, right? In shade anywhere from a half an hour to several days. <laughs> okay. I think the sun will go down and come up. So may, yeah, that's a lot of time. Of prime importance is the careful monitoring of exposure so that the correct amount of exposure is given the print. The necessary exposure required by a given negative will vary greatly <clears throat> with conditions. The exposure of albumin and salted paper prints must be carried on, on past the point where the print looks right. That is a very kind of subjective terminology, looks right. We talk about printing until it kind of bronzes. And I'll talk about that in a second, but he doesn't, but I will. 
since the prints lose density in the toning and fixing solutions. The degree of overprinting necessary depends on the nature of the binder material. What would you, what are you using? Gelatin, albumin, what are you using? The character of the negative and the type of toning bath used. Experience is the only way to know precisely how much overprinting is required. But a starting point for beginners might be to overprint one and a half stops for albumin paper and two stops for salted paper. That's a pretty good range, right? And that's where uh, one, one and a half to two stops, you're definitely going to see what we call bronzing on the edges, the darkest part of the image, the shadow areas, you're going to start getting a, a metallic look to it. If you, if you, It'll start reflecting back. That's You're going to print so dark, so deep, you're going to say, oh, my God, I've ruined I've overprinted this. You know, one and a half to two stops, that looks pretty severe, right? I mean, it really does. Um, but once you fix it, tone it, fix it, and, and get it at, through the processes, you're going to see where your, for that particular negative, in your particular conditions, with that particular type of pop you're using, you're going to figure it out. That's why note-taking is very, very important in this process. Super important. So let, let's go on to the strength of gold toning solutions. This is, uh, I just found a bunch of gold uh, toner in my, my supplies down here, which I'm really happy about. My favorite is uh, the Tetanol, which is a, a cyanate, which is a little different. But this borax is good too. It's not quite as aggressive, but this is a good gold toner formula. So let's talk about this. Papers with a porous surface, such as arrowroot, plain salted paper, etc., require toners with much less gold content much less than those intended for glossy albumin. And especially if you do two coats, you're really going to, you're going to need some strong toner. These porous papers tone more quickly and would rapidly become overtoned in the strong baths employed for albumin paper right there. Toning baths for matte and salted paper should contain 0.1 to 0.2 grams of gold chloride per liter. That's a tiny amount. While glossy albumin paper toners should contain between 0.4 and a half a gram of gold chloride per liter. That's that's over twice as much. Toning of bath, toning of ba both albumin and salted papers is generally done by inspection and should take from three to 15 minutes, depending on the conditions and what you're looking for, right? The conditions um, and the kind of paper being toned uh, and your personal preference of toning. Toning should generally be carried out well past the point when a visible when visible change takes place, same as printing, right? Uh, it, it takes place in the image color. The toning solution should be used at temperatures of 17 to 20 degrees Celsius. Very important. Very important. To, that that's critical. And prints require constant ag agitation in the toning solution. And another thing that I would add to, to this is: do not tone in a ribbed tray. Use a glass flat bottom tray. Those ridges are going to take on more toner and be more active than a flat bottom tray. I've said this for years. And people tell me, what are these lines? Those, those are from your rib tray. You can't tone in a rib tray. The toner solution is ruined even by a trace of fixer. So cleanliness and care are required. The toning operation is best carried in a weak incandescent light. So weak white light, 20 watts or so, so that the color of the prints may be accurately determined. In case of the glossy albumin paper, the toning should be continued until only the shadows of the print retain their original warm color by transmitted light. Judging toning by looking at prints laying flat in a tray may be deceptive. It, it's very true. After toning is completed, uh, the prints should be placed in a running water, given a five-minute wash before fixing them. And then you're going to have another change in the dry down. So this is a big experimental process as you go through making prints like this. But here's a great recipe. 10 grams of borax, sodium borate, uh, one per, 40 mils of 1% uh, uh, chloride solution. That's, uh, you can do the math on that. That One liter of that will get you a long way. 40 mils for a liter of toner, that'll get you a long way. So if you spend a little money on gold, um, you'll, you'll, you'll get it. I know gold's expensive, but. So, that's a really high level overview. God, and I just barely made it. We still have a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, but here's the thing. Albumin printing, salt printing, 
wet collodion negatives, all very much worth pursuing. And then you have a whole set of other printing out processes you can work with. Collodio chloride is one of my favorite. Gelatin chloride or the aristotype family, what, some of my favorite. Um, then you can get into pigment printing, carbon printing, oil printing, really spectacular stuff. But you need to understand these foundational, these, these, these really important concepts. They will help you understand what you're doing um, as you go along. Tom says, Rollins printing on glass. Tape. Beautiful. I don't have EDTA for clearing. Can I use a weak hypo? Use sodium bisulfate, Tom. If you don't have, e or if you have some sulfuric acid, you could, you could use a little bit of sulfuric acid, about a 10% solution, or sodium bisulfate will, will clear. He wants to clear the dichromates out of his gelatin. Uh, and glass clears fast. Glass, unlike paper, will clear those dichromates out fast. What's a good dry time between oil coatings and reset? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a sixty-five thousand dollar question. If, you know, if you're using lithographic inks, which I'm sure you are, they can take in the winter time. Man, they can take a month to dry. Um, so you know, it's hard to say. Um, in the summertime, you can get by with about a week. And here in Colorado, I can dry prints in a week. Uh, if I do a black coating, let the the oil print dry. Glass, however, you're doing glass. That that could that could speed you up. I, I need to keep that in my mind. That could that could speed your process up. I really can't say, Tom, but you'll know when it's dry. You can refloat it, swell it, and run another color on it. Let it dry. You can do that as many times as you want. Great question, man. We want to see those, Tom. When we come back, I, I'd love to see those or send them along to me. Focus Law says, Quinn, how you clear the silver bath? Mine very dark brown. Yes, yes, very good question. How do you clear that silver bath? So mine turns red. If you put it in the white light, it's like, God, it's like a dark red wine, right? Cowlin, you saw that on my shelf there? Do you, do you remember that image? Let me, let me pop back here real quick. Uh, I don't want to bore you, but just, just, just so you see. Um, let me pop back here. You'll see right here. Wow, we did a lot of slides. This, this I did. Yeah, I did a lot of them this week. Um, you'll see right here. This box is a kilo of cowlin or china clay. Fifteen grams of china clay in a liter of al uh, silvering albumin silver nitrate. Shake it up. Let it settle. Your stuff will be perfectly clear. Decan it off the top. And you got clear silver uh, nitrate for floating albumin paper. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. Um, China clay or kaolin, K-A-O-L-I-N. You can get it most anywhere. Um, and I recommend people, if you're going to do printing, you want to clear that, clean that silver up once in a while. I guarantee you your egg whites are going to be, uh, you're going to be uh, silvered up on the egg whites. So. Uh, or your egg whites are going to turn that, well, the salt really in the egg whites are going to turn that silver nitrate red or brown. So that china clay is good stuff. Get, grab you a kilo of that stuff. Um, hello, Baron Heidelberg. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. Ferret says, I still don't get the reason for the less silver amount for using soft negatives to get a stronger contrast, but it's about time, not the softness of the lighting. Something. Well, yes, one thing you're going to print out in the shade, right? And the lower chloride content and the lower silver content, think of it as if you, Farid, I know you drink alcohol, right? Say you didn't drink alcohol. If, are you going to drink a whole, li a whole liter of tequila or are you going to have just a little bit of tequila? Probably just a little bit of tequila. This is the forces that are coming down on that weaker negative. If you have a weaker negative, you, you want to weaken things up. You want to weaken the light up. You want to weaken the salt up. And you want to weaken the silver up. So you have a little bit more control over that contrast. Or you'll just blow that thing up. So it is. It is. Just follow Riley's suggestions. Um, uh, if you have a weak negative, print it out in the shade, the north-facing shade. You might even want to put a tissue over it or a piece of ground glass. It's going to take longer, but you're going to get better contrast on that weaker negative. So reswelling would be in about 70 days. 
70, oh, 70 degrees. Sorry, I thought you meant 70 days. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, about 70 days for the ink to dry. Uh, yes, yes, that would be right. On glass, re-swelling that gelatin, you could do 68, 20 degrees Celsius to 21, 68, 70, 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be good. And you can always watch it, right? Go back in there in 10 minutes, pull it up and look at the relief. See how you want a good swell on that gelatin, especially if you're going to re-ink it. I never do, LOL. Yeah, right. Yeah. The alcohol analogy was probably bad, but weaker is better. Weaker, you, we, you want to meet, meet weak with weak. Uh, bogus slide. Absolutely, bogus slide. Quinn, what do you think about brush application silver bath? Yes, brush application is great. A cotton ball, a foam brush. The only problem with brushing silver nitrate on pot prints is you need to make sure, number one, you want your silver quite strong. I mean, you know, 12% anyway. And, and you want to make sure you allow it to soak in. Be liberal with that silver nitrate. It's a lot like floating. You, you, you want to be liberal with that as you, as you paint that stuff on. Most people are. Some people are very conservative. They just do it like that. And then they have a weak, streaky print, right? Just, and that's, 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 you just don't get enough juice on there to make that image pop. Um, I prefer floating just for the simple fact. Um, I've, done a lot of, I've done a lot of hand application as well, too. And, you know, like I said last time, if you want those edges and you want that kind of thing, that's a great way to do it. Cotton ball or a foam brush, it's a great way to do it. You can do that. Yeah, I know, Farid. <laughs> you never drink alcohol. Right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, okay, after the silver bath, how much time must it dry? After the silver bath, you're going to, in a, in a warmer place, let's say 20, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, somewhere 60, 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, a 78 degrees, you're going to dry in about 20 or 30 minutes. You can apply some heat to those papers if you want. You take a hair dryer, not, not on high and not really close, but you take a nice warm hair dryer if it's cool in your dark room, just apply some heat. They dry fast, especially if you're using the thinner paper. That's another catch about the thinner paper. They'll dry, re they'll dry really fast. So it doesn't take much time, Colodianista. It's 12 here and I'm wanting some alcohol. Thing. Yeah. All right, Tom, you have a great day. Uh, it was nice seeing you today. So much information. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. I love it. I love it. Absolutely, Bogusla. So let's go on to this uh, next week. Um, you can read this, but I'm going to take a week or two to start working in the dark room and film some experiments to talk about and show. So uh, not that I won't do any talky, more talky live videos. I will, but, but mostly it's going to be come on here and share what I've shot, share some results and talk about them. The first one, as far as I know right now, and things could change, will be the Sutton's Method 1 for making wet collodion negatives. This is the iodide-only iodide only collodion, right? Uh, kind of like what you saw me post there that I made almost three years ago. You can watch the video, Making Wet Collodion Negatives Part 1. It was We, we did that on uh, August 7th of this year, and you'll, be see, you'll see what I, I'm going to do. I may follow that list down on my blog. I have 10 items, 10 experiments I'm going to do. You can follow along if you want. But if you're interested in knowing when I come back with a new video or update, you can do one or two things or both of them if you want. First, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm not going to monetize anything. None of that crap. I, I've said that before. This isn't about that. This is about sharing information with you guys as artists and trying to trying to experiment and find ways and, and work on projects that, that make sense. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't done that, that'll alert you for a new on a new video. Or you can go to my website, studioq.com. Go to the contacts page and just scroll to the bottom. There's a Studio Q update. Put your name and email in there, and I'll blast off an email and say, maybe I'll do like a little newsletter or something once a month or every few weeks or something or whatever. And I'm not going to bombard you with junk. I'm not going to sell your email. This has nothing to do with commercial crap, guys. Nothing. Zero. I'm not trying to get anything out of you other than if you want to come and listen to my ranting and my experiments, sign up. I'm not going to, there's no gimmicks here. So you're very welcome, everyone. That's, I appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely, Fareed. So you can do one or, one or the other. You'll know when I'm back on. And I want to end this one real quick. 
Um, this is a book. Jeannie and I read this a while ago. Um, I, I, I made, I've got tons of notes in this thing about um, really good stuff. The meaning in life, not meaning of life, meaning in life. So don't confuse those two little words, meaning in life. Um, I wrote a post a, a couple of weeks ago about the type of lifestyle that I've tried to uh, um, I've tried to develop for myself here. Jeannie and I have worked very hard for the last 30 years uh, playing the game, the jobs, um, you know, really struggling through all that stuff, saving, being conservative, and trying to get to a point of living in a debt-free life having a home, having the things we want, and having no debt. And, and I found that the only way you can achieve and find your meaning in life is to, to exclude a lot of that noise, a lot of those distractions. A lot of those distractions are designed for us uh, so we don't have this existential crisis, so we don't say, oh, my God, what am I doing here? They want to keep you distracted with your nine to five, with your this, with your that, with your football, whatever it is, whatever you're doing. This book really lays out ways to find meaning in your life. I find great comfort, uh, and I know it has to do with death anxiety and death denial. I'm completely on board. I get that. But I find great comfort in knowing that I'm existing to make photographs, to make art, to make um, communicate ideas, to communicate um, these stories, to tell these stories. And, and, and so that gives me meaning in life. And to be able to do that now, um, I'm free of any job. I'm going to be now completely, and I have been, although I've been building a house for the last year and a half, I'm going to be working as a full-time artist and I'll make a few blades on the side, a few knives on the side. But I'm going to be working as an artist with no commercial intent. I said in my blog, yeah, if I sell a print or a book or whatever, that's great. I mean, no problem. But it's not about that. It's nothing to do with that. Um, so I found uh, this book uh, has helped me a lot or helped us a lot to understand how and what is meaning in life. And if you don't have it, what that means in your life. And, there, and most people don't have that. Most people don't have meaning in life. They're struggling. And, and once you lack that in your life, a lot some bad things can happen. You can get bummed out. You can get depressed. You can start, you know, loathing in things that, you know, that, that aren't really healthy mentally. But if you can find that purpose, if you can find or purposes or meanings in your life, that will go a long way. And it doesn't have to be photography. I'm just saying that this is applicable here because most of you work in these processes or want to. And uh, I found this great. I want to play just a few seconds or a couple of minutes of this. Uh, yes, Linda, looking forward to seeing how you showed it everything. It's been a long time. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. It has. Believe me, I, I've, I've struggled with it, but I'm we're here. Um, I'm going to play this. Uh, you can watch or listen. This is a listening thing. It's not. It's audio only. This is Dr. Clara Hill. Um, and I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of this, and you can kind of get an idea. I'm going to mute myself. Be so easy. What is meaning in life, and how do we find it for ourselves? Our guest is Dr. Clara Hill, an APA fellow and professor of psychology at the University of Maryland. Dr. Hill recently published a book, Meaning in Life, A Therapist's Guide, which assists therapists as they help clients find the meaning in their lives. Today's conversation will examine the concept of meaning in life and ways to find it. Welcome, Dr. Hill. Thank you. It's delightful to be here. So there's a lot of talk out there about finding one's purpose or calling, passion, you know, meaning in life. Um, so what are your thoughts about those conversations that are happening out there in the world? Well, I think it's terrific because I think people really need to focus on finding meaning in life. And I, the, the emphasis on it is even more now than I think it used to be, which is interesting. I think in the past, um, people often just took their meaning in life as their religion or their job and didn't have much um, opportunity to think about it. I think they, they still had meaning in life. It's just they didn't have an opportunity to have as many choices about meaning in life. And I think as 
particularly as religion declines and as as job security is so uh, flexible, I think people really have to spend a lot more time trying to think about what do they want in life and, and how. You can listen to the whole thing, but I just wanted I just wanted to give you a taste of what she was talking about. Um, kind of give so, you be so easy. Kind of give what, you, is, what is oh, sorry? Kind of give you the idea of where we're at in today's world in the 21st century and trying to find purpose and meaning. It's a great book. It's it, even if you just listen to that audio piece for an hour, you'll get a lot from her. She, she's just really amazing. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know when I'll see you again, but but I will see you again. Hopefully, you know, good Lord, as they say, good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Right. <laughs> I don't have a creek, but I don't think I'll drown. But I appreciate your time, your attention over all these weeks and months and and everything. I'll try to come back to you with a uh, uh, the old format. Uh, but being live, show you some video, talk about my results. From here on out, really, it's going to be about making those experiments as they apply to my project and then showing you some results and answering questions or whatever you might have. So join me if you can. Next time, subscribe or go to my website. Uh, you'll get a little email saying, hey, next week I'm going to do this, and, and you'll know where I'm at. So thank you so much. Have a great week. We have a great weekend or a week. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.